author of Nothing to Burn. Well, that that was like my, that really happened to me. <laughs> Writer. And I'll try to understand where we come from. Professor of English and WRTC. One thing is that to not uh, feed my students cynicism. Professor Jay Varner. Change takes a long time. Yes. It takes persistence and hope. This is the last lap. Whoever you're writing about are human beings. Hello, hello, and welcome to the very first episode of The Last Lab. I'm Mia Brabham, and this is a 10-episode podcast where I interview my favorite, most interesting professors, mentors, and just really cool people during the last 10 days of my undergrad career here at JMU. I am so excited. These are all the questions I've ever wanted to ask them about their stories, uh, the life lessons they've learned, their areas of study and research, and... There's something new to learn in every episode for everybody out there listening. Today, I'm so excited I'm here with Jay Varner, professor of English and WRTC. Did I say that right? Yes. And probably actually just the coolest person I know. We are joined by Anna Peck and Zach Gordon, good friends of mine, and also fellow students from Jay's creative nonfiction writing class. Welcome! Hey. (laughs) So... How does it feel to be Jay Varner? How does it feel? Um, uh, wow. Well, I just planted my garden, so physically I'm kind of sore. I'm out of shape of gardening. Gardening is hard. I gardened this weekend. Hard. Did you? Yeah. I went on an alternative weekend break and okay. a service trip, and we pulled weeds at this farm. And it hurt. I was That's so gardening. sore. That's the first part. Did you do that? I did that a couple weeks ago. Oh, okay. And now, yeah, I was on my hands and knees digging. So so that That's part of stuff. me is, is sore. What's more exciting, because I know you teach freshmen. Yes. Or Intro. Yes. And then you also teach creative writing. Yes. And then you teach sometimes advanced. Yes. Only sometimes. Only sometimes, yeah. But yes. how is, what's the difference? What is that like? Uh, it's great. So the freshmen, for a lot of them, it's the first time they've ever kind of been in this scenario of like critical thinking and, and having to take a big project on and think about stuff long term. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really cool to see them do it. And for an intro or advanced class, they have already done that. Uh, and they think they know what they can do, but you know, <laughs> I, I want to push them in a way to get them uh, surprised and excited about it, and and realize like, wow, I never thought I could do that, but huh. I did. So it's it's fun. It's fun. We Zach, Anna, and I had you for creative writing. That was my first creative writing course. Was it, it really? It was. I told you this because you like set the bar so high. Because I, I wrote when I was little, and I wrote like a lot of things, <laughs> but then I forgot that I loved writing so much, and then so I came to JMU, and I was like, I want to write again. I took your class. It literally inspired me to wow. just write, and now, like I, I mean, I always thought I'd do fiction, but now I love creating nonfiction. I had a great time. Yeah. But what was you guys' class experience like? Fun, because we, we kind of did the same thing, where we explored mm-hmm. different essay types as mm-hmm. far as short, the, the the second one was a personal, an extended personal essay, mm-hmm. and then the last one was a journalist, a literary journalism piece, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Research and all of those things. Yeah. yeah. So that was my, my first foray into literary journalism, and that was really fun. So mm-hmm. I, I went a little overboard with that essay, I think. I got to explore a little bit about my family as well, which was cool. Yeah. Um, well, I took intro and advanced. You guys were in that together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I couldn't get in. I was so oh. mad. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to express my saltiness. <laughs> well, <laughs> so sad. Well, definitely, I think, well, I'm a journalism major, so both of those classes, like, helped my journalism writing in a way I didn't think it would. Oh, that's true. And also, I feel like the class itself, we were all, like, became so close, just sharing things. We really stuff. opened up. Yeah. So that was, like, definitely a different classroom experience I got in college because, you know, you're usually in, like, a big lecture or, like, you know, you're in your major classes and you, of course, become close to people, like, in your concentration or whatever, but I feel like this one people opened up so much more. It was great. Fun times. Yeah. I just want to know so I feel a lot better about myself. Our last paper, I freaked out. <laughs> we can laugh now because it's funny. Zach was there. I was freaking out because I really wanted to make it good and I felt like it wasn't good. So mm-hmm. I came to Jay Farner's office and I was literally bawling in his office. And I want to know how many people have cried in your office. Was I the only one? No. Because it happened. It happened. You it know, happened. But it, I think you used the last of. No, you didn't. You're not crying now. But 
Uh, no, it happens, especially here at the end of the semester where every project like has the most weight in every class. And, mm -hmm. um, and I always have to remember, like, oh, you do have other classes, not just whatever you're in with me, right? I think that's how it goes. So. Um, That'd be nice if your right. class was the only yeah. one. Shout out to all the yeah. professors <laughs> who don't realize that. Okay. That's fine. But I try to, uh, you know, I try to keep that in mind and um, make sure everybody hopefully leaves uh, in a better place if that happens when yeah. they come in. What, did you? I don't remember what I said. You were like, it's okay. It's the first draft. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And that just made me, I don't know. It made me feel better because I feel like sometimes you come into things and you like want it to be so perfect, and I think as a writer you have to get over that yeah. because it's not that's not what the first draft is for. Um, and so I learned that lesson right. that uh, it's okay to like pour everything out and to like have too much and then be in this middle of this mess. Like, what do I do all of it, with all this? Because that's where you find the good stuff, like in that mess, sort of. Yeah. You can pull out the good things, and it's better to have more than less. So yeah, well, I feel I'm pretty. Better than I came in. Well, uh, <laughs> the writer Annie Lamont, she says that, you know, every draft has to be shit, so this yeah. is, we just made this podcast PG-13. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the uh, and even phased me, happen. honestly, to be completely honest. Like, she oh, she said, uh, you know, you have to give yourself that right to do it, yeah. um, because if you don't, if you think, if you're, like, so afraid and so afraid that everything's going to be perfect, you'll never get to that part. You'll never get to that part of going through the weeds and kind of pulling out. You know the great stuff. So, see, look what we did there. We just circled That's back sort of around like to gardening and weeding. Which we you did. Can... We can end it here. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> Maybe that's why I like gardening. It is. It is. It's. It's. Therapeutic. There are just so many metaphors that you can take with writing and yeah, everything. I so. love metaphors. Yes. So meta. I think we should bring that back. Was was that like '90s slang? Meta. Like meta. That's meta. Mm -hmm. like, Anyways, <laughs> all right, so one thing I obviously love about you, you're a good writer, but also I love that you lead by example, so you know I want to talk about this. You wrote a letter to Obama. I did, yeah. And he wrote you back. Yes. And it's framed, and I'm staring at it right now. I wish this was visual in this instance, but can you talk about that? I'm so excited. Just tell the story. Uh, I mean, I know it, but just right. for everyone. I think it's so awesome. Yeah, I get, um... So about a year ago, I was a visiting professor at Hollins University, and one of my former um, JMU students uh, is from Roanoke, and she came out to a reading that I was doing, and she brought along two of her friends, her co-workers from WDBJ7 in Roanoke, uh, Chris Hurst and Allison Parker, and we just hung out that day and talked for a bit, and um, Allison had gone to JMU, and... Um, I had been a former reporter, so we just kind of hit it off, and it was... You know, kind of that shop talk stuff, and then of course we had JMU and all of these things, um, and it was great. Um, and I, I had stayed in touch with them a little bit, you know, after we met. Um, and then of course in August, Allison, along with her cameraman Adam Ward, were murdered on air in Roanoke, um, and that was, uh, you know, hor horrible, horrible. I remember I was getting a haircut. I mean, the, the most like mundane possible thing, and I was I just checked my phone, and I knew that station, mm -hmm. and and then I clicked the link for the news and saw the names. And I remember driving home that day, and there were FBI and state troopers all over I-64 in Charlottesville, where I lived, and it was just so surreal thinking like th th all of this was happening, mm -hmm. uh, and I just I felt so powerless uh, of what can I possibly do. Um, and the only thing I really know how to do is, is to write, so I wrote every representative that I had about this. And, um, and I thought, especially about JMU, because this is a community that I love. I mean, I love it here, and I love um, the students and the colleagues, everybody. Uh, and I just asked, you know, what should I, um, what should I tell my students when, they, when this comes up, when they ask about gun control and ask about, you know, how are they staying safe? What are you doing to help them? To make sure they stay safe, uh, and I never expected any of them to write back. Some of them wrote back form letters that obviously, you know, a staff member had prepared, and it was like, "Oh, here, this guy wrote about that issue. Send him this letter," uh, and then they signed it, you know. Um, but uh, the president had read the letter in September after I mailed it. I think I mailed it two days after uh, Allison was killed, and. Um, the White House called me in early February 
I was just in my office and, and looked and saw, <laughs> mundane. <laughs> the phone rang and, and I looked at my cell phone and I was like, huh, that's weird. Washington uh, D.C. number. Washington D.C. Yeah, <laughs> uh, must, somebody must be calling. They want me to vote for them or something. Um, and then I listened to the voicemail. And it was the communications director at the White House saying that the president had written me back and they were just calling to confirm my mailing address. So it was quite. Um, Surreal. It's still surreal. It's very surreal. But um, I've thought about his what he wrote uh, uh, often since it arrived. Because he said, you know, one thing is that to not uh, feed my students cynicism, which I think is really um, easy to do. You know, if I'm not careful when we talk about politics or any kind of issue, you know, it's really easy to be cynical about this mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, but to just realize that change takes a long time. And it takes persistence and hope mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of those things. So and I think that was a great message for them and also for me to yeah. hear. You know, I, I debated whether or not I should share that story because mm -hmm. I didn't want to seem as though I was, um, you know, taking advantage of something or trying to, to, to jump on, you know, an issue that was mm -hmm. not mine in some way. Um, but then I just thought the message was too important not to share. Mm -hmm. And a guy wrote me, a guy actually wrote me yesterday, oh, wow. an autograph collector guy who offered to buy the, the letter from me. Um, What'd you say? I said, no, no <laughs> way. I'm not going to do that. He offered a lot of money, but I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So, that's incredible. Um, I think that's really cool about like what he said back about just change and how it happens slow. I think yeah. we forget that sometimes. We're all like so fast paced and we just want to see results and results and results. But um, it is ultimately about just like persistence. Yeah. And yeah. It could be frustrating, but I think patience is huge virtue. Patience is hard. Yeah, it's hard. Very hard. Did you fangirl a little bit? Uh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. What was, what was your reaction yeah. when, you, uh, when you got it back? When I it, so it arrived the next day. Uh, Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Whoa! Yeah, I don't know how. I, <laughs> who knows? But um, yeah. it was it was at my house, and uh, when I opened it up, um, I won't, I've only actually touched it once. The real thing, you know. It's just like um, I was like, wow. I mean, the president of the United States held this and wrote my name on it, and I, I think it wouldn't have mattered uh, who the president had been. You know, I mean, it's the president of the United States. Yeah. Um, and its own White House stationery and all these things. And it was just, uh, wow, you know, the most important person in the world thought of me for however long it took to write this, yeah. which is just insane. So you've also written your own book. I did. Which is so cool. Nothing Left to Burn, yeah? Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that? And just sort of the process of writing uh, an entire book. <laughs> and, and an, like entire the, an entire one, like a whole one, in the uh, process of that, and like the highs, the lows. I started writing that the same semester as all of you are in now. I was it was my last semester, uh, senior year of college. Oh my gosh! Why are we writing books? Yeah, what are you guys what doing? What the am I doing life? with my life? <laughs> <laughs> one week left. Okay. The semester before that, I took a novel writing class, and the idea oh. was that, not that you know we're going to write the whole novel. Okay. But that you're going to go in with the idea of, of making this big thing and writing this this big piece, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the professor, uh, Tom Bailey, he was um, wonderful. And uh, he, he was giving me you know, advice on this novel, and I came in with a novel about a, a dad who was a firefighter mm -hmm. in this small Pennsylvania town, and his father was an arsonist who had burned down the family's house twice. And, and Tom had read this as a novel, like, mm -hmm. you know, the first 30 pages, and said, well, this is good, but it's so unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> it's fiction, you know. I, I don't think people are going to believe that. And I said, well, well that, that was like my, that really happened to me. <laughs> My dad was a firefighter, and my grandfather was an arsonist, and um, and I could see his eyes kind of light up, you know. It's, I was so young, I didn't even know that you could, like, do that, you know? <laughs> that, that anyone would want me to write, like, my yeah. story? Um, 
So I started it then, and um, I took a year off, went to uh, be a reporter for a year, mm -hmm. and continued to work on it, and then went to grad school. And I had initially done it as a series of essays, kind of like The Things They Carried by Tim mm -hmm. O'Brien. I yeah. wanted it to be this kind of cycle of essays coming in and out, in and out. Um, but it needed a more, it needed a more, uh, an arc to it mm -hmm. in terms of story. And, um, and I just worked on it for three years in grad school. It was my thesis. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough, I guess, that I was, that somebody cared enough to publish it and, and like it. I mean, anytime anyone reads anything, one person, that's great. So I rewrote it probably like 18 times. Did you cry in someone's office? Uh, I don't think I cried in their office. Just away? Yeah, probably. <laughs> there were some parts writing it that were really emotionally tough. I yeah. Mean, I just didn't want to relive from my life because mm -hmm. um, my father died when I was nine. I didn't really want to go back and kind of dig into that, but mm -hmm. I knew that I had to. That was I, the part I saved for last because yeah. I, I was avoiding. That's tough. What would you say is your one like truest belief about storytelling that you found like either writing that book or writing anything that you've ever written? Hmm. Truest belief? How do you mean? Like craft wise or emotional wise or I think anything you want. Anything you want. I know everyone says that. They're like, whatever you want. But really like what's your <laughs> one just like truest belief? Like I guess like your lesson in storytelling. Like what have you learned that you would tell other people or like what makes a story like good uh, humanity mm. I think that's the main thing you have to ch uh, tap into that that kind of humanity that uh, everybody can relate to in some way mm. so it's there's got to be a universal thing yeah. um, not everybody has a dad like mine but we all try to understand our parents yeah. and all try to understand where we come from um, so telling a story like that or if looking at a more literary journalism piece you know uh, whoever you're writing about are human beings and what is their story what what is their uh, that thing that's driving them the thing that they're working at and that they want and and the heartbreak that they've had in life the way all of us have had and I think if you can tap into that and tell it um, it makes us understand something bigger about the world it gives us a chance to kind of weigh where we are at in our own life against everyone else's stories, which is what we do all the time. So, so eloquent. I'm inspired. I'm going to go write that book now. That whole novel. <laughs> all right, so last question, and then we're, there's like a speed round. I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> it was like one of the first like weeks in your class, and we talked about the author, Cheryl Strayed. Am I saying that right? Strayed, yeah. Strayed? She, strayed. Like she, strayed. Just she straight strayed. Strayed from, strayed the, from the path. Strayed. Yep. Cheryl Strayed that's, from the path. That's why she chose the name. I want a cool ass. She chose it. It's not real? Her last name, no. Ch strayed. Oh, she, yeah, she made that name up because she did feel as though she had strayed. Yeah. My life is a lot. Just kidding. <laughs> but so she said this thing, and it's still to this day. I have my cork board in my room over my desk, mm -hmm. like my writing center, and I have an index card, a big one, and it says, "And nothing was ever the same." And that's something she wrote because she said, "I have it right here. I'll read it." I have it right up here too. Do you have it? I do. Probably oh, somewhere. that's so hype. I think so. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I feel cool. I'm like Jay Varner. Yeah. Um, but she said, when I teach writing, I tell my students that invisible, unwritten last line of every essay should be, and nothing was ever the same again. By which I mean the reader should feel the ground shift, if only a bit, when he or she comes to the end of an essay. There should be something at stake in the writing of it, or better yet, everything. <laughs> so for you, in your entire life, this doesn't have to be writing, um, but I feel like writing is almost life. That sounds so cliche, but... I think the two intertwine because you write because of life experiences. Like, it's born out of life experiences. Yeah. So what was a moment for you in your life where nothing was ever the same? I think writing like that is a way of life, you know, mm -hmm. and thinking like that is. I mean, any story that I say <laughs> or tell, mm -hmm. I try to go for that. Mm -hmm. And it could be something really small. Like, I'm, I'm working on an essay about weather because I like weather. I, I saw that on your Twitter. And why? why? I don't know why. <laughs> what does that consist weather. of? Like, are you just, like, always on the weather channel, or...? I have, uh, somebody asked me the other day, which weather apps do you use, or what, what weather app do you use? And I was like, I have six. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I just love it. I don't know why. Like, we, weeks before, we'll get any snow, 
Yeah. He'll message me and be like, <laughs> like February 13th, we're going to get 25 inches. I'm like, oh, God, got to go get the bread. And he's, he's right every time. <laughs> Oh my god. And you know, it's it's one of those things, it's like, wh- why? Why? Why is that? Maybe this is why I like weather, because it's some like larger kind of symbolism of fate and my, my inability to control anything. Maybe that's why I have six weather apps, because I want to like know what's happening and control it, you know? That's a pretty small thing <laughs> in terms of realizations, I guess, about my obsession. But, you know, any story that you tell... It has to be different, or you have to kind of understand something bigger mm. at the end of it uh, than when you started. Mm. I think it has to be like that. And when you look at your life in terms of the narrative of it, and you look at either the big picture type of thing or like mm-hmm. those smaller moments, those patterns that you see, and you start to put them together, you, you can make sense of things. And if that didn't surprise me, I, I never thought about that. This is why I like weather until I started writing it. And then I did have that moment of like, whoa wow, there's like something bigger there than just me being weird, which, <laughs> which is definitely also part of it, but yeah. um, keeping that in mind I think all three of you, because you are at the end of this narrative of four years, you know, nothing will ever be the same again, I guess what do you think of that at the end of college, getting ready to graduate, is that true? <laughs> Can you even make sense of it yet? It's, it's an overwhelming time like, I understand that nothing will be the same, but it's such a different thing to, like, actually experience that, like, yeah. oh, I won't probably won't be going to school and, like, doing all these things. You're not going to see the same people again. Well, I'm, I'm going back to Boy Scout camp this summer, so awesome. I'm just delaying everything for work. Are for, you regressing? For, like, you're actually going <laughs> yeah, back? Yeah, I'm, you are a Boy Scout? I'm actually <laughs> turning, going back to 16 years old. And <laughs> what is your, uh, what do you think? Well, okay, for me... I have to hear my commencement speech. I talk a lot about it and I use metaphors, but Good. I'm sure um, it'll be right. great. Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm really excited. to sob. I'm excited. I'm nervous. I need to make edits to it today actually. But um I I've noticed like talking about patterns. Mm-hmm. I get a certain way in transition transitionary periods in my life and it's this sort of like internal freak out and I like hold on so tight and I'm like, I don't want it to end. But then I always come to this this realization, I can't change anything about it. Like, I'm freaking out, but it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how I feel, like, it's coming. And so I think it's coming in terms mm-hmm. of that balance where you're like, okay, this is coming. Hold on in a certain sense, but sort of, like, learning how to also let go and just, like, sit back and, like, look around and appreciate. And I think that's where I'm at right now. It's that, like, this is happening. So, like, enjoying these last moments, just being with those people you love right before you go on to the next chapter because it's coming which is exciting yeah There's enjoy always that next it thing. enjoy yeah. what's happening you know i think that's the thing yeah. okay i'm really excited so these are 10 questions um very like last lap centered um okay. it's i feel like some of these you have to think about okay but think fast the first thing that comes to your head um okay. but ready favorite moment of undergrad uh all of undergrad oh man undergrad. uh i went with uh my um uh, College professor Gary Fink, who I just uh, just emailed yesterday, actually, so we're still really close yet and great. And I went with uh, two other people graduating, and he took us out and had a beer together. And that's when I felt like, wow, like I kind of like that was a thing, like a movement mm-hmm. toward. I wasn't, I didn't feel like a student anymore, and that was like a big deal. You're up there. You're yeah. in there. Yeah. Your favorite moment at JMU. Oh, jeez. Um, Man, that's really hard. <laughs> it's always at the end of the semesters, I think. It, there, it was always bittersweet, especially the end of the spring semester, because mm. on one hand, I want to go back and fail people who are graduating, like, retroactively, so they can stay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you pay for my school. <laughs> but then it's also really cool to see uh, just just uh, everybody graduating and, and thinking of what they've accomplished. Um this uh, like May. May is always like a, it's heavy and also like exciting and all those things. It's you guys feel all those emotions too, and so do I. So. <laughs> um, okay, your heart song. Do you know what that is? Heart song? Yeah, it's my favorite thing. It's, so it's not your favorite song. Your heart song is like you wrapped up in a song. It sounds like you. It's like the words are like true to your story and who you are, and it's just like you in a song. I don't know how else to explain it. Okay. 
I feel like it changes. It's changed throughout my life. Uh-huh. At the moment, the song. Uh, and yeah, and it's the weirdest song. It's the most obscure esoteric song ever. It's called Maggot Brain by <laughs> Funkadelics. It's like a 10 minute guitar solo. And it's just, yeah. Okay, your cry song. That's a tough one. Probably there's this uh, bluegrass country ish singer named Iris Dement. Mm-hmm. And she has this song called Mama's Opry, which is how her mother wanted to be a grand old Opry singer and would sing along to the songs on Saturday night on the radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's something about that song, whether it's the melody or the words, it brings back childhood for me and kind of all of this longing and nostalgia. The moment you felt most alive. <sighs> Man, that is really hard. This is like <laughs> heavy shit. You need to yeah. have like favorite color and stuff like that. Most alive. Um, I'm going to see Pearl Jam on Friday for the 16th time in Philadelphia, so um, maybe then. Um, probably uh, it was May 3rd, 2003, when I saw Pearl Jam play in State College, and they played for three and a half hours, which was the longest show at that point. Oh. It was with my best friend from college, and we were graduating a week later, and we just kind of sat outside afterwards and just stared into the dark mm. together processing what it was but it was a great feeling so that's a powerful that. image that's yeah awesome yeah it was great <laughs> how do you overcome fear just do it i mean force yourself to do it i mean you acknowledge it you have to acknowledge that it's there but you can't um completely be succumbed by it all right if you weren't a professor what would you be uh, Please what, say weatherman. Uh, that was one. I was actually <laughs> thinking, I bet you'll ask that question driving up here today. Um, and I was thinking about other careers that I would want to have. One would be, uh, would be a meteorologist, a detective. Oh, that's like investigative, like journalism. Right. I think it's that's stuff awesome. like that. I'm just drawn to like figuring out things. Mm. I mean, I don't know if I can. <laughs> I might be a terrible detective. <laughs> I'd be a, a detective the way I write. Like, oh, you know, this essay might take me six years. That's okay. It takes as long as it takes. If you could win an award for anything, what would you win? Yeah, I mean, what? Geez, the Pulitzer Prize, probably, right? Mm. For a writer? I mean, geez, can you imagine? <laughs> National Book Award? I mean, anything with writing, I guess, that would be awesome. Like, total off-the-wall dream would be, like, a, a Grammy. Like, I get to play guitar. I was, I was gonna say, would you would you rather be like a superstar novelist or a su- like a, a rock star? Uh, uh, definitely the novelist. It's, it's the rock star is way too extroverted all the time. Oh, wasn't it? I think it's Sia actually. She, I love Sia. She really hates press. Yeah, she wears like her hair yeah. is her face. Yeah, it's awesome. Do you watch um, Carpool Karaoke? No. She's so I, talented. I was just thinking about that. Did you watch it? Yeah. The one with her. You have to watch. She's so talented. She's in the car with this late night talk show host, mm-hmm. singing her heart out, and it, and he's just like, and she's like, you can't do that. But. Yeah, and it's like <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's this interesting because she like talks about like how she's been like famous for like years because she's yeah. written all these songs. Oh yeah, Dennis yeah. Like, yeah. Used to, like yeah. yeah, and she used to like not cover her face, but then when she became like, see, she like started covering her face. Hmm. So like that's part of like. Wow. Her Isn't hiding there? her persona or whatever. Have no idea. Okay. Um, who would you think in your acceptance speech for that award? My teachers, definitely. Because um, I, I don't, you know, I don't think anyone had ever challenged me or, or believed in me in that way until I got to college. Uh, so definitely them. Um, and now, you know, to be sappy, um, probably my students here because I think they also, in similar ways, like encourage me to, to be better, to think differently. There's a symbiotic relationship there. My heart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then finally, one piece of advice for every college student going out into the world in one word only. Patience. Patience. You know? Because I think you mentioned it earlier, but how we expect or with change, right? Like, we want things to happen immediately. We live in this culture where things happen immediately. You know, life's not like that. It takes patience. It takes a long time. For years, I wanted to teach. And this is my fourth year, fifth year here, I think. Um, and it just felt so slow, and I just I wanted nothing more than to do that. And it, it took forever to kind of get there. But now I look back on it, and I'm like, wow, you know, like, that actually it wasn't that long. And why was I feeling such this rush and pressure? Because society loves to do that. Mm-hmm. But you need to have patience and just think, you know, things happen the way they're supposed to happen for you. 
and just have patience with the world. I love that. That was a fantastic ending note. It's over. I'm sad. I feel like we could talk forever. We, we could easily. We could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very easily. Soon all right. this will all be over. <laughs> no. <laughs> and nothing was ever the same. <laughs> Again, I left out a word. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. For coming on the last lap, being our first guests. It's very exciting. Wow. Thank you, Zach and Anna. All right, thank you all so much for listening. I hope you learned something new or at least laughed a little bit. Subscribe for more podcasts and for other stories and content. If you're listening on YouTube or Facebook, leave a comment to answer the takeaway question in the description. Respond to any of the topics or even start your own. I promise to read them. Finally, find me on Twitter and Instagram at yours truly, Mia underscore. Don't forget the underscore. And let's be friends. Thanks again for listening. And remember, the best learning happens inside and outside of the classroom. Remember to tune into the next episode with Dr. Pappas. This is the last lap. And until then, gotta run. The Last Lap is produced and edited by Mia Brabham. Music by Brian Kim. This episode recorded with JMU Love in memory of Allison Parker.